My name's Todd. I'm with PA of the Day. Excited that we're doing this. It's great to see almost 200 people on live with us, which is really fun and something we've never done before. So if you like this and it and you learn something or you just enjoy the community of having everybody on, let us know and we will try to do more of them. Again, I said, if for those who are just joining, there's a pinned comment in the chat. There's a little form, a short form you can fill out that will register you for we're going to do some giveaways at the end. We're going to draw some names and I'll talk about those in a second. But giving us your email, will get you entered into that. And then when this is over later this afternoon, our time, we will send a email with the presentation, the links that Nathan talked about. And so make sure you fill that out in order to get that. Like I said, the first time we've done something like this. So we, if it, it seems to be going well received, so we look forward to doing it again. In that form, there's a little comment section. So if you'd like to leave a comment. You're welcome to. Speaking of the giveaway, we're going to give away three prizes at the end of the class. Two of them are PA the day gift cards to our merch shop. We have, for those of you who don't know, we have shirts, mugs, hoodies. We're just rolling out hats. So that'll be fun. We're going to give away a $25 gift card to someone and a $50 gift card to someone. So those two names will be drawn at the end. And then the third prize is coming from Nathan. It is a lifetime subscription to Subaligner, which is a tool that he's developed to help you easily align the your mains to your subs. You can put in the brand of speaker you have up top and the subs and the number, and it will give you a great starting point that you can save a lot of time on the show. He's giving away one lifetime subscription to that product, which is going to be great. If you're not familiar with Nathan, he is a live sound engineer, obviously a lot of experience touring with Ringling Brothers and now is freelance and does a variety of corporate and community events and music events, very experienced. He has a passion for teaching as well. And that's obvious if you consumed any of his content. He has a an active YouTube page with a ton of helpful videos that he's made and demonstrations. He's written articles and tutorials on his website, and he has training courses like full-fledged training courses that are have a real personal touch to them. He's really passionate about teaching. And he you might have heard of Sound Design Live. It's his podcast where he interviews a wide range of industry, industry professionals, and I personally really enjoy that podcast. It's very informational and does a great job of covering topics in an interesting way. So definitely check out his podcast. During his presentation, if you want to drop any comments or questions in the chat, I'm going to be monitoring that and I'll be sending him those questions. And at the end of each section, he'll address a few of them. And then at the end, he'll be able to spend a lot more time covering a lot of those questions. And that's a goal for today is to give a sample of information and give some basic concepts and then see what you're interested in learning more about. And uh, we said this was going to be an hour. We advertise it as an hour but he has agreed to stay after class and hang out and answer as many questions as we can. So make sure to stick around for that and allow some more time. Last thing, feel free. If you have somebody that you think would enjoy this, share it right now on your page, or if you're in any audio groups that you're active in, please feel free to spread the word. So I think that's covered it. And I'm going to turn it over to Nathan to get started. All right. Thank you, Todd. So Back in June, I was in Bentonville, Arkansas. Where is Bentonville, Arkansas? It's in Northwest Arkansas. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, that doesn't really matter. So that's where you can find Walmart headquarters, one of the biggest corporations in the world. And I was doing an event for them. They were having a picnic outside in a parking lot with a live band. And the producer had requested that sound be directed directly into this narrow rectangle where they had games and stuff set up. And they wanted sound here, but then not outside of the rectangle where they had the food trucks because they had people ordering food and they had people coming from all over the world. And there would be a lot of people speaking English as a second language. So they wanted to keep that area quiet and separate. And I said, great, I love this challenge. I will design the perfect subwoofer array to just fit into this little slot of audience shape. And I designed it and we deployed it. And here's what it looked like. You can see in the picture here, here's the subwoofer array that I came up with. And here's the stage. So as usually happens with live events, once we actually got on site, things changed a little bit. And I was forced to move my front of house position from directly in front of the arrays to off axis a little bit. And I thought, no big deal, it'll just be a little bit quieter. So what a surprise when we started sound check and all of a sudden there was no bass. Where did it go? And I walked back into the center of coverage and it all came back again. And it turns out that I made two big mistakes. Number one, the subwoofer array that I designed was too narrow in the high end and it changed over frequency and the 
covered shape of the subwoofer array did not match the same shape as the mains. And so you had this weird variance as you walked across and the tonality would change because the relationships would change. And so that's why I'm here today. I want to share with you some ways that I've screwed up my subwoofer arrays in the past and hopefully save you some time and embarrassment in the future. I thought about calling this workshop Beyond BS, like Beyond Bullshit, because our goal today is that you would leave with an improved working knowledge of subwoofer arrays. I don't think you'll be a master of subwoofer arrays by the end of this, but I do hope that you can learn to talk about it better. All right, so I want to say thank you all for being here. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing with your time here today, and so I'm glad you decided to spend some time with us. And of course, a big thank you to Todd and PA of the Day for hosting this event and for keeping me entertained and motivated over the years. I always like to start with some gratitude for some of my favorite teachers in audio. So check these people out. Bob McCarthy, Mauricio Ramirez, Pat Brown, Merlin Van Veen, Francisco Monteiro, Paul Cozell, and every guest that I've had on the Sound Design Live podcast. So Todd introduced me already, so I don't need to say much more about myself, except that I am the founder of Tracebook and Subaligner, and also the creator of SubSchool, which is a new four-week intensive program that I'll be talking a little bit more at the end of today's workshop. So that's a balance of doing this sort of like open access, free to everyone kind of workshop is that we do some training for a little while and then I use like the last 10% of our time together to pitch you on something new that I'm doing. So I would love for you to get as much as possible out of today's event. So please close anything that's going to distract you, get something you can use to take notes and make sure to enter the giveaway. I think Todd already mentioned that. If not, he'll put a link in the chat for you again. And speaking of the chat, I'll just mention it again. I have some stuff that I wanna share with you, but for this to be really valuable, we need you to ask questions and share. So feel free to use the chat as a conversational tool as well. If I say something that you disagree with or that you just have something, or that you agree with, or do you have something to share, go ahead and put that into the chat. It's all fair game. If you do have a question that you want me to address, It'll be helpful if you write the word question in all capital letters, and that'll make it really clear to Todd that, like, hey, this is something I want Nathan to see. So here's what we're going to cover today. So should I split my subs up left and right or put them in the center? Should I put them on the ground in a horizontal line or stack them in a vertical line? What about flown subs? Is that good or bad? What happens when flown subs are in a vertical line? What about directional rays, these cardioid subs that I've heard about? How can I use them? How can I get started learning about them? How do I build them? What's an in-fire array and when should I use it? And then we'll get into some of the basic principles of alignment. Okay. And I'm gonna go ahead and go, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the answer to some of these questions, or at least what I think is my preference when it comes to these choices. And I don't expect you to understand this all right away, but if I tell you where we're heading, then hopefully that will help make the journey a little bit easier. So I have this little mnemonic device. When it comes to left, right versus center, left bound to fight, center is saner. And you'll come to understand that more as we go through this, I hope. I'm gonna teach you a thing that I call the left-hand rule, which basically helps us remember that as line length gets longer, then the narrowing of coverage, the beam narrowing happens perpendicular to that line. And uh, we'll see that come up several times. We'll find out that flying our subwoofers makes a big improvement in terms of efficiency all around. We will talk about how to basically fight reflections and reverb by using directional arrays and how to build them. I have some templates for you. And we'll talk about when you might want to use a, sorry, I forgot to scroll down. When you might want to use an in-fire array, when you have at least three elements per array and enough real estate to deploy them. And then when it comes to how to do alignment, my two principles I'm going to share today are number one, do your homework, create alignment presets for pairs of sources, and then deploy the, that preset in the field and equalize any distance offset with delay. Okay, so that's where we're heading. But first of all, how do we talk about this stuff without being an asshole? 
So this was inspired by a recent Bob McCarthy interview on the Signal to Noise podcast. They asked him, what do you wish you knew when you started out? And he said, when I started, I wish I knew how to talk to people without pissing them off, how to be right without being a dick. And the goal here is to move beyond words, right? So imagine that you are working with someone from another country that speaks another language. You don't understand each other, but you can both listen to an acoustic phenomenon to sound and walk around and hear it and then change the position of the subwoofers and walk around and hear it. We want to get there, but we're going to be talking about how to do that with words, but in a way without a constructive way. So what are some tips? So I've been having conversations with people about this, posting questions on Facebook and talking to some of my mentors. And so I put together some tips for you guys. So the number one tip is to start with the end goal in mind and try to find common ground. So you might say something like, hey, I'd love it if we could really get even coverage across the audience in this event. I see that you have spec'd the Nexo RS18, for example, some subwoofer. And it seems like that's a great choice. I'm thinking that the best subwoofer placement for even coverage would be in the center, about one meter from the stage. What do you think about that? Do you think that's a good idea? Or you might intentionally pitch them a bad idea so they can pitch you a good idea. Just some way to get the conversation started without you just coming in like a steamroller and saying, this is what we do and this is the only way. So a week ago, I worked on this fundraiser for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And I am going to tell you the story because I still make mistakes with this topic all the time. So when I showed up, we had a classic case of role confusion because there was another audio person who thought he was the A1 and I showed up and I thought I was the A1. And so I just immediately started telling people what to do because we're in a hurry and it's like raining a little bit. You guys know how it goes. And then he started getting exasperated with me and he was like, what do you mean the array goes over here? What do you mean it's this tall? What do you mean there's only one array? And all these kinds of questions. And I didn't really have a lot of patience for it in the moment. And I was just like, hey, just do this thing. It would have been smart, looking back now, for me to just pause, take a second, and have a conversation and say, oh, hey, what? I guess you were expecting this. Okay, this is why. Okay, and then we'd figure that out. And then I'd say, hey, here are my reasons for doing this thing. I could have explained that. I could have justified that easily and that would have been the kind thing to do. Okay, another tip about how to talk about this stuff is about saving face. Bob McCarthy is endlessly quotable. Another quote from him from my book, he says, if you fix somebody's sound system but you humiliate them, you'll never work with them again. So imagine that you are called in to consult and you immediately just start telling everyone all the mistakes that they've made. And maybe you're right and maybe the job gets done, but then maybe you don't get referrals, maybe you don't get hired by that person again, and we all know that Pro Audio is based on personal referral. So you might say something like, hey, here's an interesting thing I discovered. What do you think we should do? Or, hey, I'm seeing the response here and it sounds like it's too quiet here. What do you think we might change? Or why do you think this is? And so, I'm talking a lot here, and I know this is like a one-way interaction, but in the chat, I would love it if you guys would share some of your tips. How do you talk about this stuff without being an asshole? How do you have constructive conversations about subwoofer placement and about sound system design? What we'll see as we move forward is that a lot of the correct or best subwoofer designs, best practices, don't look right especially not to lay people. And so we need to learn how to talk about this stuff so that we can get good results and work well with people and make people happy. Okay, I have a couple more tips. Bob McCarthy says, never make sure you're never talking down to someone. So he said he usually starts by saying, hey, I don't wanna talk over you and I don't wanna talk under you and I don't wanna waste your time. So please stop me if I'm saying stuff that you know already. So you learn to read the room, you learn to use the word we as much as possible. What do you think we should do here? How can we improve the situation? And at the end of the day, I think to remember that this is a service industry, right? So maybe all we can really do is warn someone 
about the possible risks, the possible results, and the consequences, and then they have to make their own choice. Okay, so just going to check real quick to see if there are any questions. Have not last audio cold weather. Let's see. So Ken says, I often use the, what I've done in the past has been, I need to make my, one second, I need to be able to see the rest of this. Text wrapping, there we go. So Ken says, I often use the, what I've done in the past has been successful approach. Yeah, that's a great idea. Hey, I worked on a show last week that was just like this, and here's the results that we had, okay? Cookie says, I have an Alaska audio I know cold weather affected the high frequencies. Does it also affect low frequencies being in cooler climate? Thanks. Let's talk about that in the end. That seems like more of a broad question. So you can leave that one on there. Brian says, listen twice, speak once. That's great. Like measure twice, cut once. I like that. And Brian says, that means check yourself, think it through, be attentive, consider the client's perspective, and then give your feedback. Yeah, really great. You have to show that you're listening. You have to show how much you care before people care about what you have to say, especially if they don't know you and you're just working with someone temporarily. Okay, let's get into the subwoofers. So we're gonna start with ground stacked subs. Should I split my subs left and right or put them in the center? Of course, it depends. It always depends. That's always the answer to any audio question because these things can be complex and there are all these different things at play and stakeholders and it always depends. We know that. Sometimes the subwoofers are nailed down and you can't move them at all. What choices do you have after that? I don't know. So things can be limited. And what I wanted to say here is that, yes, I know that the answer to every question is it depends. And we're going to talk about some ways in that it depends on. But I also just want to give you some really clear directions, clear guidelines that are really my preferences. So when I'm saying things like, hey, don't do left, right, do center, that's 100% my preference. So nothing's really good or bad. It's really just different outcomes. So that's my goal to you today is see if I can help you leave with some clarity about some of these issues. Okay, so what's the deal here? The deal is that if you uncouple your subwoofers, move them apart, then you will have better symmetry with your mains because you'll have left, right mains, left, right subs, super common, the most common sound system design probably. And you'll make everyone happy because it looks right, but you'll have big peaks and valleys across the audience. And at first it seems like, oh, just the bass gets quieter, no big deal. But if you're outside where you can really hear this effect cl clearly and you're mixing from a power alley, then to the audience, it just sounds like there are places where it sounds good and places where it sounds bad. They don't know the difference. They don't know really what's going on. They're just over here and they are walking across the audience and they're saying, oh, I see that it sounds good here and it sounds bad here. This must be the sound person's fault. They don't know what they're doing. So I would just say, don't underestimate the critical importance of having powerful, solid, even bass at a show. And if you've never been put there. I guess what I want to say is that if you never put subs there, then people might not notice. But if you add subwoofers and then take them away, then it's really clear. So let me just give an overview of this picture in case you've never seen something like this before. So I believe that these are called ISO bars. And we are looking at a plan view of a sound system design here. So I have a little magnifying glass. So we're looking at it from the top plan view. Imagine that we're up above. And I've got a stage here, and then I've got a subwoofer to stage left and a subwoofer to stage right. And then as we move out in front of the subwoofer, those areas closest to it are the loudest, of course. And so they have these dark red and orange colors. And then as we move farther away, the colors move towards these, I don't know what to call it, bluer colors, and then finally to black. And everything that's in black has been attenuated by 30 dB. And I tried to do that with every one of these images so that you could have some consistency for comparison. So they're all attenuation from loudest to quietest and then 30 dB. So what's going on here? So Todd asked me to talk a little bit about why this is happening. So let me get my drawing tool here. 
And I think the clearest way is to imagine yourself at these different positions and then to draw lines or triangles. So imagine yourself at this position. You're here right in the center. This, you're at front of house. You put front of house there. It's going to sound great all the time, no matter what. You are at the tip of the isosceles triangle, right? Two equal sides on a triangle. Two equal sides equal arrival times, right? So it takes the same amount of time to get from this guy as it does to get from this guy. Everything's arriving completely in time, perfectly in sync, no problem. So we're getting all summation all the time. Now, let's imagine that you are standing in this position over here. Now, what do you hear? You hear the same two subwoofers, but they're not perfectly in sync, perfectly in time anymore. Now, this guy is arriving first. Let me do a smaller line. This guy is arriving first, and then this guy is arriving a little bit later, right? So this would be a similar length line, and now he's taking this much longer to get there. And since he's arriving later, then he's arriving out of time. We don't have perfect summation anymore. Now we have some amount of cancellation. And judging from this black area here, it looks like he's arriving 180 degrees out of phase. And we're, that's why we're getting so much cancellation through here. And then what happens at the other end over here? Now, this guy, this second subwoofer is still arriving late, but he's arriving so much later that now he's gone 360 degrees around the phase wheel. If you don't know anything about the phase wheel, don't worry about it. Just know that we have these series of peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys because as we become uncoupled in terms of time, then we get these kinds of patterns. So this is just a, an overview, a beginning workshop. So I don't want to get into it too much deeper than that. But hopefully this helps you understand a little bit more that arrival times here are playing a big part in making these kinds of patterns. And I put together a little video for you. Let me hide this. So in this video, let me make the video bigger. You got to keep hiding this. So in this video, what you're going to see are basically what I just talked about. Two sine waves, one of them being delayed over 360 degrees. And I'm just going to play it for a little bit first, and then I'll talk about it. So what's happening here? So when you look at these sine waves up here, one of them is getting delayed. It's getting pushed back. And over here, we have what seems like hands on a clock. And so imagine that this is your one of your subwoofers, and this is the other one arriving late. And I don't know if any of these graphics will really trigger anything in your mind, but this is one of my favorite graphics because it really makes sense to me now. I think about things trying to push in two opposite directions. So if this guy, let me clear all this. If this guy's pulling this way and this guy's pulling this way, then the sum between them is going to be at this angle and it's going to be lower than both of them together. So remember back at the top, when we had two, both hands of the clock aligned, then this guy, each of our subwoofers is at 0 0.5. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 is 1. So that's why the sum between them is one. And then as we go through here, I'm going to turn the sound off. As we go through this animation and the hands of the clock move farther and farther away, the sum between them, the angle is the average between them here. And then you'll see this green hand here is getting smaller and smaller. Okay, so hopefully this isn't scaring you guys too much. I just wanted some kind of animation to show you the effect here. And maybe if you've ever looked at an oscilloscope, this will be familiar for you. So now you're going to see we're about to move 180 degrees out of phase here. So imagine two, a tug of war pulling in opposite directions, completely canceling the sound. You guys are going to get the link to this presentation later. So you'll be able to watch all of these videos as many times as you want. You'll be able to get all of these notes. We're not going to give it to you now because we want to keep most of the conversation in the chat, but you'll be able to get all of this stuff later, I promise. Okay, getting back to where I was. So, God forbid that your mix position ends up in this power valley, right? If any of you have ever happened, if any, if, if that's ever happened to any of you, please type yes into the chat. It is 
not a happy thing, especially if you get surprised by it. And we're going to do a listening example here in a second so you can see what it's like. So yeah, Todd, if you didn't hear any of the audio, we're going to do another listening example. So I'm going to start a video. You may want to get some headphones. This is a just a little fun video I put together to give you a sense of what it might be like to mix from a power valley if you accidentally ended up there. So if you have headphones, you may want to put those on now. And then Todd, let me know if there's no audio from this video and I'll stop and fix that. Yeah, Nathan, I don't think we're hearing the audio on that video either. I think we lost your voice as well just now. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. I thought I did. Okay, I'm going to restart that share. Or you know what? Maybe I can show floating meeting controls. I'll just start the share again. So stop share, start share, broadcast, share sound. Thank you everyone for your patience. Share. Okay, so if I play this, how was that? Yep, great. Okay. Sunday in November, weather bothered. Where my shadow used to be by the water when the colors were the same the morning. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. It was just for fun, but the idea there is that if you are in a power valley and all of the low end has been sucked out of your mix and you're in a hurry and you don't think of it, then you may just be trying to fix all of that with EQ and it's not getting better, it's actually getting worse but you don't know what's happening there. Excuse me. That's why as much as possible, I try to keep the subs together. So I try to avoid the left-right setup whenever possible. And I know it's just going to make my job more difficult and the audience less happy. Now, one exception is when the audience is very wide. So if the audience is very wide, then uncoupling the subwoofer as many times is the only way to go about it because there's just no other way to get subwoofer energy way out to maybe these corners over here if you have a very wide audience. A couple of potential tips or ameliorizations, ways of dealing with being stuck with uncoupled subwoofers is to potentially use directional arrays. So I've tried this a couple of times and it helps a little bit. I can't say it's a huge improvement. So here's a show that I worked on back in June. And there was some question as to whether or not we would have space in the front for subwoofers. So I said, okay, if I'm going to be stuck with the left-right position, then I'm going to use a directional array. So here we have infrared arrays aimed out. This helps reduce the amount of interaction in the middle and improve isolation to the sides. Again, it's not a complete fix. You can still hear the comb filter as you walk through there. And it was just lucky for us that the sound engineer for the band was happily mixing on an iPad. And so he just went and stood in the center of the audience and mixed from there the entire show and it went fine. So one creative solution that I've heard about but haven't tried is been popularized by Dave Rad. So if you watch Dave Rad's videos, you will have heard about this. And it is basically decorrelating your channels. The easy way to do this is to double mic an instrument. So imagine that you have a microphone on your bass amplifier and you have a DI from that bass amplifier, those signals are effectively decorrelated. You send those to your left subs and your right subs, and then you have effectively reduced this comb filter through the audience. Again, I, I can't comment on it much more because I haven't tried it on a show, but it's just another good tool to have in the toolbox the next time you're stuck with uncoupled subwoofer arrays and you have the resources and the time to double mic some things. Okay, but center is my preferred solution. As I mentioned, I try to get that whenever possible. As soon as I get a design from someone that I'm working with, I always ask them, hey, can we get a center position in the front? And if I can't, then I'll usually move to behind the stage. The only times when I wouldn't do that is whenever it's a DJ or a band because that could really screw with them. One time I was working on an event in San Francisco with my friend Andy Lipnick. And the only place we could figure out to put the subwoofers was right behind the DJ. And we thought, he'll love that. This is going to work out perfectly. And then the DJ got there and he's like, maybe that'll work. 
he was game to try it, but then as soon as he started playing, it didn't work. That's all he could hear was subs. He couldn't hear anything but subs because the subs have to be so loud for everyone else to hear. Anyway, it was a mess. Another thing that I've tried is with shows in the round. Here's a show that I worked on. I know this picture is pretty dark, but there's a stage in the center of the room, and then we have screens at all four sides, and we have sound systems at all four corners. And initially, they put the subs at the corners as well, not that, hey, I like a center subwoofer position, so I know what I'll do. I'll push the subwoofers under the stage, and it just barely worked because the stage was like two inches taller than the subwoofers. And so I have this video here, which is really just for fun, but I'll go ahead and show it to you. So if I can make this big, there's no sound with this one. This is just a time lapse of me hooking up these subwoofers under the stage so you can see how funny it was for me to try and crawl under there and do this. And this worked fine for most of the show, but as soon as the DJ started, it sounded bad. It was just like, rattling and vibrating the whole stage and it does something weird to the sound waves for them to be like ported out of this like small space and i don't really know why it's so bad but ever since then i just never try and do that anymore um it's the same thing for mains for me if i can get a center position and that makes more sense then i'll do that all day long so here's back on the show that i worked on sent one single main position here and all the subwoofers underneath. You may think that this these kind of things are hard to pitch to people, like no one's going to go for that on my show. Maybe you just need to think of the right resource or the right words or the right motivation. So I did this a week ago. And what I said to them was, hey, I'll have more control over the sound. And I said, it'll sound better. We'll have better sight lines. And it'll take half the time to set and strike because we're not doing two arrays. And the producer was like, great. So that's how I got away with it. This might be a good time to use the saving face strategy from Bob McCarthy as well. As we've had other people mention, hey, I just worked on a show last week that had this sub set up and we were surprised to find that there are areas of big cancellation. So here's what we did instead, something like that. All right, let me check and see if there's any questions. How wide is too wide for center subs? So... Maybe let's look at that one again at the end as well. What we're going to find out as we get into the next section is that the longer you make your line, and therefore the wider the horizontal array, the more narrow the coverage. So we'll get into that in just a minute. Okay, should I stack my subwoofers all in a tall vertical line or a horizontal line if they're on the ground? So this is what I just promised. So my general guidance is to stack them for wide audiences and put them in a horizontal line for narrow audiences. Now this is a bit counterintuitive and for a long time I had trouble remembering how to do this. So I have a mnemonic device for you, but let me just say that I think initially it makes sense to people that they see, hey, my stage is this wide, my subwoofer array should be this wide. Or my audience is this wide, my subwoofer array should be this wide. And then sound will just go like this. That's not really how it works. As subwoofer lines get longer and longer, then the summation comes out in a perpular, perpendicular beam that gets narrower and narrower as the line gets longer. I worked on a fair once and they wanted sound to go everywhere. So although there was a stage in the middle and the stage faced an audience, they still wanted sound to go everywhere. So what did I do? I stacked up my four subwoofers all on top of each other in one tall, vertical line on one side of the stage. It looked funny, right? And my colleagues were like, what are you doing? Do you know what you're doing? And I explained to them like, this is how it works. And then when they were able to hear it afterwards, we were able, you could walk around the stage, walk around the entire place and you could hear how smooth it was. So it makes sense once you hear it. As I mentioned, a common mistake is to just spread your subwoofers evenly across the stage. I see that a lot, especially on Facebook. But this is a good lesson because I saw this in Sean Soli's Facebook feed and then I interviewed him on the podcast and I said, hey, why are you doing this wrong? Not really like that. I said, hey, tell me about this because it looks like you are making the line longer by spacing the subwoofers apart like this. And then at the same time, you're curving the array to try to get it wider. So aren't those two competing design strategies? And his answer was really interesting. He said, 
this was where we were forced to put the subwoofers. We couldn't put them anywhere else. They had to get pushed up against this thing. So his placement was very limited. It had to be like this. And then they used some creative delay to create a virtual sub arc to still match the size of the audience. He had these weird limitations and he was able to make it work. And I feel like a good lesson here for me was that I see people post photos of stuff and you don't really know what they're doing unless you know what the processing is. So it's a good, it's good to ask people. You can say, hey, what? tell me about the processing you did on this array. Tell me more what's happening here. Okay, so there are calculators out there that help us figure out exactly how to design these subwoofer arrays, what their length and height and the arc and all this stuff should be. But I think the first step is just this kind of general knowledge about what happens as we make the line longer. I have a bit really bad memory, so I always need some kind of mnemonic device. So if you hold your hand up in front of your face like this and make an L shape, then I have started calling this the left-hand rule. And if there are any electricians out there, I know that the, this was, I stole this from electricians, right? And it means something different for electricians, but we're gonna use it just to describe the perpendicular summation that happens with a line of subwoofers. So as the line gets longer and longer, then this narrowing effect perpendicular to the array. Some of you don't need this, but I had the hardest time remembering, is it perpendicular or parallel? Perpendicular. One last tip about these arrays, co the coverage angle of these arrays does get more narrow as frequency goes up. So if you're going to make a line of subwoofers like this, then consider creating some kind of an arc to maintain that covered shape so it doesn't change so wildly, drastically over frequency. All right, let me check the questions again. Cool. Hope everybody's doing well. If you are joining us in the middle of this, welcome. Thanks for being here. And just know that type as much stuff as you want in the chat and put your questions in there with the word question in all capital letters. Nathan, let me interrupt for one second. Hey, so we are, a lot of the questions have been asked, but we're saving them toward the end. We're only doing some specific ones after each section. So if he passes up and it looks like he's not answering, we'll get to it. So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Okay, flown subwoofer arrays. I'm curious what you guys think about this. So type into the chat, do you think flown subwoofer arrays, good or bad? Do you try to always do that? Do you try to never do that? Have you had good experiences, bad experiences? I say that the main benefit of flying subs is less variance across the audience. So instead of just slamming people on the front and then it gets quiet in the back, slamming them in the front, quiet in the back, what you do is you just, you raise the subwoofers up in the air and then the pattern stays exactly the same. But now it's quieter in the front and the same level in the back, and you just have less variation. So less color changes here across the audience. So these pictures, the pattern looks the same, but we have less color changes across the audience. Another benefit is that your mains and subs will have less physical displacement. Blah. Less physical displacement. So as you move across the audience, if main and sub are together up here, then they'll always sound like they're, they have the same arrival time. Remember we were talking about problems with arrival times earlier. So that's an improvement. They're in the same vertical plane there. So that'll give you a better chance of getting everyone into the coupling zone, which just means less misalignment across the audience due to the changes in physical distance offset. Plus you clean up the area around the stage. So hopefully producers should like that. And on top of that, in places where they're really serious about maximum SPL exposure for people in the audience, that's often measured at the point in the audience where it's the loudest. So imagine if someone can reach out and touch your subwoofer array in front of them, it's not unimaginable that could be like 130, 140 dB SPL right there. And that means it, if it's that loud for that person, you're gonna have to turn it down for everybody else. But if you can get your subwoofers up in the air and lower the level for that, those people in the front row by 10 to 15 dB, now you can turn the whole system back up by 10 or 15 dB. So a little bit abstract there, but could be helpful. My, this happens r rarely for me, but I'd say my biggest memory of flown subwoofers was working with the circus. 
And so what we would do getting into a new space is we would build this giant grid on the ground, put all of our speakers on the grid, and then the grid goes up. It has all of the video and lighting and everything else as well. So we've got our 650 HPs here, Meyer Sound, MSL4 is behind it, and then CQ1s down here. Okay. Now, there is a myth that flown subwoofers are less efficient than ground subwoofers. And I say it's a myth because this myth was recently busted by L Acoustics. When you get to this page, later on when we give you guys the link to, these, to this presentation, and you click on this link, it's just gonna take you to a page with a lot of stuff. And I had to do that because it seems like the link changes every time. Anyway, you go to this page, just scroll all the way down, and you will find this page on the efficiency of flown versus ground stacked subwoofers. And you'll open that PDF, read that paper, it's really interesting, it's not hard to understand. And what you'll come to learn in general is that we should not be afraid of flown subwoofers. If you respect some simple design guidelines, you can fly subwoofers all the time. They will be just as, if not more efficient than your ground-based subwoofers, and you get some other benefits from that as well. Of course, ground-supported subwoofers are generally easier to deploy. They require no special tools. Anybody can do it. You just drop them on the ground there. But I think that's what happens most often because that's just what people default to. It's what we're used to. But I think we should try to change that a little bit. Like, I think the default should be flown subwoofer race. So let's make that the default, and then we just won't do it if we don't have the resources. One thing to watch out for with ground-based subwoofers is that you may sometimes accidentally create a very narrow crossover region between main and sub. This can happen if you're like me when I first started out and you're always adding high-pass filter to the main and you're always adding a low-pass filter to the sub. Sometimes they don't need it. A lot of subwoofers come out of the box designed to work together perfectly without you doing anything, at least modern speakers. So if you're adding a bunch of high and low-pass filters, then you're making that acoustic crossover region very narrow and it's so narrow that then maybe you're separating instruments so it seems like kick is coming out of the sub snare is coming out of the mains so then you're listening to the concert and it's going kick sub kick <laughs> okay could be right so watch out for that what happens when you fly vertical arrays what happens when flown subs are in a vertical line you guys know the answer to this question already right so we hold this shape up again and we see it just like on a ground just like on the ground, if we have a vertical array of subs, then the beam is going to narrow perpendicular to that line and the coverage will change. So we have these two pictures here, horizontal array. And I'd say it's the same, same general guidance. Use horizontal arrays for narrow audiences and then use vertical arrays for wider audiences. So what if you are Metallica and you're doing a tour in the round and so you want subwoofer energy to go everywhere. You probably already know the answer because I talked about how I worked on that fair and I wanted subwoofer energy to go everywhere. So what do you do? You build the world's biggest just vertical line of subs and you fly it up in the air in the center. And then coverage will, of course, narrow perpendicular to the array and it will get more narrow than the vertical plane, which is fine, but it still goes everywhere horizontally and it has its own name, it's a TM array. Somebody asked, what are the delay settings for the TM array? It's zero milliseconds. They're just all together as close as possible. Okay, what is the deal with cardioid subs? The deal is that cardioid is, has become, I think, just a catch-all to mean directional subwoofer arrays. Consider the fact that I think we're all comfortable with terms for microphones like cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid, and others. But we don't say that for subwoofer arrays. We don't say, hey, here's my cardioid subwoofer array and here's my hypercardioid subwoofer array. We probably should, but that's just the way people talk now. It's fine. So just understand that I think when people say cardioid subwoofer arrays, they mean directional arrays in any form. So the deal with cardioid arrays, aka directional arrays, is that it's really our only weapon to fight reflections and reverb. Why do we need to fight reflections and reverb? The first rule of sound system design is to put sound where the people are and then not where the people are not. So keep it off of the walls and keep it off of the coverage of other 
loudspeakers, which is pretty much the same as a wall. So with our full range speakers now, we have incredible accuracy, right? If you've ever played around with a speaker and you just play 11, 12, 13 kilohertz out of it and you can aim it like a laser, it just goes by your head. We don't have that for subwoofers yet. So our only tool that we have is either cardioid elements, which you can get now as a single element or building cardioid arrays. So on top of this problem, the low end is where we have the least control, right? Because most subwoofers are effectively omnidirectional. And then on top of that, it's where we have the greatest amount of electricity and a lot of movement going on in the mix, right? There are all these instruments, drums, the harmonics from the bass guitar, the low end of the male vocal, guitar, like piano, there's all these things going on there. So it's super busy. We have the least amount of control and there's all these things going on. And so it's really critical to try and do something to get control there. So that's my suggestion for you as much as possible try to use directional elements or directional arrays in your design. Again, I feel like that should be the default, not something special. Oh, we're going to do something fancy and special. That No, the, dire the directional array should be the default because we need some kind of control. And I should just mention that because of all the sound bouncing around in the room, most of the people in the audience are not hearing direct sound from your subwoofers they're actually hearing reflections. So they're all in the reverberant field. So just another reason why we want to try and narrow our, get control so we can, as much as possible, deliver more direct sound to the audience. Okay, how can I get more energy onto the audience and less onto the stage? Use cardioid speakers, arrays, both. So this is my preferred design. I always just try and get a center position as we've been talking about. Here we go. I try to get a center position, get a directional array in the air would be better. And if I can't get a center position, then I'll go behind the stage. So typically you need at least two subwoofers unless you have a single element that is a directional, that is a cardioid sub. You need at least two. And a lot of times you have one that is the reference and just receives normal signal. And then the other subwoofer is the one that, let's say does the work, does the heavy lifting. It is spaced differently and it receives a different drive channel. So it has maybe a delay, maybe a polarity inversion. And that's how we get some control with summation in one direction and cancellation in another. How can you get started with playing around with this? Let me first tell you about just a couple of templates here. Like I said, I wanted you to be able to leave with not just maybe some abstract, con abstract concepts, but with some specific guidelines or directions. So I put together two templates here for you, one for a gradient array and one for an in-fire array. And the way I designed these is that I looked at several different subwoofers and just found like an average common operating range for subwoofers and put together a little template here for you. And so you'll see like there's an arrow here, it's pointing at this rear sub. So this is the spacing. This is the delay and you need a polarity inversion. Over here, we have an in-fire array. And so the arrow is pointing to which sub. So this is the rear sub. This one has three milliseconds of delay and one meter spacing. And then it goes on and on. Don't forget the filter settings here. So you see recommended filter. I think it is probably the absence of these filters that has made some people dislike these kind of arrays because they do have an expiration date. And beyond that expiration date, we can have little problems start to happen. So be respectful of the filters and try out these templates and let me know what you think. Okay, so how can you get started with exploring some of these conditions? My suggestion is that you get two subwoofers and go outside away from any boundaries where you can just listen to direct sound and then just have some unhurried time, take a day when you can just play around with them. So what might you do if you go to just play around with them? You might start out with the two subwoofers side by side like this, and then you might turn them on one at a time and then both together. And then you might walk around, listen everywhere. If you have an audio analyzer, you might also use an audio analyzer. And then you might just adjust the position of one of them. So just start by doing one thing at a time. So 
we move one sub a little bit farther away and then we walk around and we say, oh, how does this change? Well, it seems like it got quieter over here. I wonder why that is, but it's the same level here. You move it a little bit farther away, a little bit farther away, keep doing listening tests. Then you start over, you move it back. And now you say, hey, what happens if one of them has a polarity inversion? So you invert the polarity of one of your subs and now all of a sudden the sound gets real quiet and you're like, where did the sound go? What's going on here? What happens if we adjust the position and we have a polarity inversion? Now everything is inverted. Where we used to have summation down the middle, now we have cancellation. Wow, that's interesting. And then you just go on and on, like then reset everything and now try just adjusting the delay of one of them. So this is just my suggestion for how you could teach yourself some of this stuff because it is really helpful to memorize these patterns and that can make you really fast in doing system design and solving problems and being creative, but you still need the part of it where you are familiar with what these things sound like so that what the significance is and it's like tangibly for a listener. You want to be able to say, hey, this sounds really bad, so we really need to fix this or this is a minor problem and here's what it sounds like, or at least to you. Okay. Uh-oh. So how do in-fire arrays work? Well, an in-fire array, yeah. In-fire arrays work by creating perfect alignment in the front and a chaos of arrival times in the rear. And you should use them when you have at least three elements in each array, at least one meter of clearance from boundaries, and that's the same for all directional arrays. And you have a priority for forward summation because that's what the in-fire array does. So this is a common scenario for medium and large events that lack the kind of real estate in the front of the stage. So you're forced to move out to the side of the stage where you do have space to go long and you can have a long line of subs there. And of course you could do it in a flown configuration as well. One piece of trivia here is to watch out for non-acoustically transparent stage skirts. I did an interview with Adam Hill who told me a story about working on a festival where every morning the stage crew would put the stage skirt up and then it would get wet and it would act like a boundary and it would screw up their subs. And so he would have to go every morning and tear it down. Which stage skirts are acoustically transparent? I don't know, but probably assume that none of them are until proven otherwise. By the way, I see that we've just crossed an hour. I know we promised that this would be an hour. Obviously we're going a little bit long here. We had a couple of minor technical problems. If you need to jump off, that's totally fine. This is all being recorded, but if you can stick around, that would be great. Okay, we're getting into our last section here, which is the, what are the basic principles of subwoofer alignment? And I'll just tell you quickly, the two of them, number one, preparation, and number two, aligning. Let me say that again. Number one, preparation. Number two, equalizing the distance offset with delay. This concept can be really simple but you have to do the preparation part of it, right? So there's this famous quote, every battle is won before it's ever fought. So the battle of alignment is actually won at the warehouse during pre-production, not in the field. And I know some people are gonna hate me for this, but I believe that if you are waiting until load in to start thinking about alignment, then you either have extremely high confidence or you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> you just don't know what you're getting yourself into. So if you haven't investigated the alignment between two speakers under controlled conditions, then how do you expect to be able to align them once everything is in the air? So a lot of people think they can do this by ear. They say, hey, at the end of the day, all the audience has is their ears, so I'll just use my ears. So here's the test, and this would be fun to do in a group of people, a group of friends. Pick two random sources, main and a sub, hopefully from two different brands. Go outside, again, where you can just ideally listen to mostly direct sound, and try aligning them by ear with whatever method you like to use. Try a few different methods. I've done this a few times at different workshops, and it never works. We get, we try several different methods, we get several different solutions, and then we measure with the audio analyzer, and people's minds are blown. So they're like, how could I be so far off? Because little things can go wrong and you don't really know why. And that's a whole conversation. But I would say watch out for that. I have heard of people who can do this by ear, and I'm sure it's because they practiced a lot. So it's not that it can't be done. It just hasn't worked for me. Again, this is all, these are all based on my preferences. So number one, do your homework, get familiar with how the two sources work together. 
create an alignment preset somehow by year with an audio analyzer, whatever you want to do. And many of these presets can be had from the manufacturer. So you can contact the manufacturer or you can get their alignment preset guide, L Acoustics, who else? RCF, there are several other brands. And I think I have, yeah, I have an article here that talks all about that. Okay, so you'll be able to look at that later. Principle number two, phase does not change over distance. This is surprising for people, but the phase that you measure right in front of a speaker is going to be exactly the same 100 feet, 100 meters away. The only reason that it changes is because reflections start getting involved. And then it looks like it's changing because of the reflections. But we don't want to align to a reflection. So because of this principle, you can equalize any distance offsets with delay. So imagine that you go out into the field and you deploy your preset where the two speakers were together right next to each other, but now you separate them. Now you can just fix that problem with delay. And you can do that through a few different methods, but one of them, which I use in Subaligner, is just taking distance measurements and converting those to time. So I work on a lot of corporate events and corporate events love to happen in some of the worst acoustic environments. And I feel like I've tried every subalignment method and none of them work, at least not consistently. And I think without years of practice. So if you don't have specialized tools and years of experience using them, then do your homework. If you use an audio analyzer and you don't want to end up with something terrifying like this, then set your stuff up ahead of time. This is what I do. I go to the warehouse, I measure the speakers and I get the preset. Here's what one of my students did. They set up their stuff all equidistant from a microphone. This is how you do it. If you use a real-time measurement system, smart, open sound meter, sat live, then you're going to measure everything all at the same time and figure out what that alignment is. And then you can work with really clean data that looks like this instead of this terrifying stuff. Okay, so that's my guide to getting started with alignment. I have another listening example here. I think we should go ahead and do it. I know we're going long here, but I feel like this is an important topic to people. And I want to give you an experience of what a misalignment might sound like. So in this listening example, what you're going to hear is basically, again, me just inserting filters. Let me get back to that spot. This is effectively me just inserting filters, but it's the same thing. When you hear a misalignment, oftentimes it can just sound like there's a big dip in coverage. So you want to put on your headphones again here, and this, I think, takes about 60 seconds. Okay, so I hope that was fun for you guys. Let me get myself turned on again. Oops, there we go. Again, you guys will be able to listen to these videos again, but I would love for you to type into the chat which of those test signals made it easiest for you to hear the change. So when I was showing you the alignment versus the misalignment, was it easier to hear with the pink noise? the black pulse, the red pulse, or the music. And maybe one of your takeaways from the workshop today can be that the next time you try to do one of these things by ear or you want to verify by ear, you can say, hey, I remember that workshop. I really like listening to the black pulse or the red pulse. That's much better than music or whatever you think. So hopefully that helps a little bit. So what this video is showing you is what a misalignment might sound like because a misalignment could take the form of a comb filter, which is just like a big dip in the response. And so all of a sudden, all your bass disappears. So basically, you were just hearing the sound of perfect pink noise, and then the bass disappears from the pink noise. A perfect red pulse, and then the bass disappears from the red pulse. Pretty simple, just like a little bit of ear training. Okay, so I apologize. I forgot to talk to you guys about how these different arrays work. So Todd had asked me like, hey, can you just give an overview of how the gradient and the infrared array work? And I forgot to do that. So coming back, we'll do this quickly, but I think this is important and also fun. So when I'm trying to understand something about a subwoofer array, as I mentioned at the beginning today, I find it can be helpful to imagine myself listening from one specific position. Before I try to understand what's happening everywhere all the time. First, let me just say, hey, what would it be like if I were standing right here? What would that sound like? I know that nothing has happened to this guy, 
this guy's being delayed back to him, this guy's being delayed back to him, and this guy's being delayed back to him. So what does that sound like for this guy? That could be like physically moving these boxes. So this guy, as I said, is being delayed back to this guy. This guy is being delayed back to this guy. And this guy is being delayed back to this guy. And so at this position, everything is arriving in sync. It just sounds like four subwoofers all perfectly together. Okay, so I have a little bit of an idea now of what's happening for this guy in the front. So I'll undo this. Now what's happening, what's it like for this guy in the back? What's it like in the back? Again, this guy is, nothing's happening with him, but this guy's being delayed. So he's gonna sound like he's coming from back here. This guy's being delayed, so he's gonna sound like he's coming and all of this stuff is happening. So again, let me try and do that with position. So nothing's happening with this guy, no delay. This guy's being delayed back by one subwoofer like that. This guy has even more delay. And this guy has even more delay, so much so that he would probably go off the page, right? And so now in the rear, we have a chaos of arrival times because this guy arrives and this guy arrives much later. This guy arrives much, much later. And this guy arrives much, much later. <laughs> so that's why it's a mess in the rear but we have enough subwoofers that we get these cancels and we get an overall broadband like lowering of the entire operating range there in the rear. So that is the infire array. Let's take a quick look at the gradient array. And again, let's position ourselves like we're standing in the front. And hopefully this will help you guys think through other arrays in the future as well. For this array, it's the front speaker that has just normal signal, nothing's happening with him. But it's the rear guy that is being delayed backwards. So what's happening there? What's that, what's that like for this guy in the front? So again, I'll change the placement and I'll say, hey, this guy I know is being delayed back and polarity inverted. So this guy is arriving on time. This guy is arriving late, but he's arriving late 180 degrees perfectly out of phase so that when I insert that polarity inversion, boom, now they're actually aligned. So although he's arriving late, he's polarity inverted, so he's 360 degrees late. Remember that we talked about these clocks, these hands on the clock, and so he's gone all the way around the clock. So yes, he's arriving late, but you still get perfect summation. You get a range of summation in the front, about one and a half, one and a half octaves worth. Then in the rear, it's almost the opposite story. So again, this guy stays the same, but this guy gets delayed back. But now it's he's on top of him. So this is really interesting, right? Because for this guy in the rear, this subwoofer is getting delayed and he should be arriving exactly at the same time. And in fact, he does. So now both of these subwoofers are arriving at exactly the same time. But remember, one of them is polarity inverted. So now we have two things arriving exactly the same time, but one's polarity inverted and they cancel each other out. So really a cool design how this gradient works. All right, thank you guys for that. We're gonna do a quick recap here. And then we will get into the Q&A and the giveaway, and I'll talk a little bit about subschools. So should I split my subwoofers up left and right? Now you guys know my preference. Left and right, bound to fight, center is saner. What about horizontal or vertical lines? Just remember the left-hand rule and general guidance that I have for you is do horizontal lines for narrow audiences and do smaller lines or vertical lines for wider audiences. Remember the TM array, right? Or that installation I did at the fair. I recommend always flying your subs when possible for improved efficiency. For the question about horizontal or vertical in the air, I think it's almost the same as on the ground. We talked about that. With directional arrays, that's my recommendation. Always use directional arrays or directional elements when possible. Play around with placement delay and polarity to teach yourself what they sound like. What's the deal with the infrared array? Well, it's like business in the front, party in the back. 
And you should use one when you want max summation in the front, have at least three elements of per array, three elements per array, and you have enough real estate, enough space to actually deploy them and get one meter away from any boundaries. What are the basic principles for main sub-alignment? Number one, create an alignment preset. And number two, deploy it in the field and then equalize any distance offset with delay. So this is just the beginning, right? We just did a real fast overview of a bunch of concepts. And for some of you, that may have been enough. But for some of you, maybe that just piqued your interest and you want to go deeper. And now you have even more questions. So we talked about left-right subwoofer arrays, for example, but what are some more things we can do to help reduce the power alley, power valley contrast? Are there any improvements we can make? If I use a center subposition, how do I design that center array so that the coverage shape matches my audience shape and it matches my, my shape that I'm creating with my full range speakers as well? If I fly my subs, how high should I fly them to maximize the efficiency across the audience. And with so many different opportunities and possibilities for cardioid arrays, which is the best one for my situation? How do I optimize the design, then verify it in the field once it's, de once it's deployed? And do I have to design something from scratch every time? Or are there some repeatable templates or recipes that will give me predictable results? And for subalignment, I'm going to teach you the one foolproof alignment method that I found that works every time. And for everyone who enrolls in the next seven days, this is the pitch that I have for you. If this sounds interesting for you and you feel like you might want to get on board with it, if you enroll in the next seven days, then you're going to get a lifetime subscription to Subaligner. Now, Subaligner is the web app I created to help you get the most accurate results in the field with simple distance measurements. You don't need any expensive tools or a PhD. And I like to say that it's so simple that even a video tech could do it. So SubSchool is effectively a course just like this one. We'll meet online. We'll have four different lessons. We'll, we will cover arc subs, gradients and infires, left-right complications, and then making alignment easy and accurate. And we'll do that starting in October. Now, all of these lessons will be recorded. They'll all be about 90 minutes long. And so I would love it if you can make it live. But if you can't, just remember that everything's recorded so you can watch it later and keep up with it. And then at the end of every lesson, I will give you assignments and homework because in between each lesson, you have a week to do your integration, basically. So you learn something new, and then I want you to go out and try it in the field, see what it sounds like. That's where you really get your hands on it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have more questions. And then we'll come back into the next lesson and we'll discuss those questions, look at your designs, and talk about what happened basically. Now, Todd warned me about this, but I would love to offer everyone who joins SubSchool also one 30 minute private training with me. And Todd warned me about this because he said, Hey, what if 200 people sign up? How are you going to do that? We'll just see how it goes. So, I'll, if you're one of the first people to sign up, I'll definitely do the meeting with you. And then we'll just see. I may not be able to meet with 200 people, but this is what I would like to try to do. My, as, my aspiration is to meet with everyone. Okay, so the tuition is $300. And why, while I feel that this is completely fair and of really high value because I believe in my own teaching and the results that my students get, I do want to give you just some exciting bonuses to help offset this a little bit. So number one, if you sign up in the next seven days, you will get a lifetime subscription to Subaligner. And also just for everyone who's here today, a 30% discount. I'm going to put these codes and these links. So Todd is saying that he wants me to give him the link in via Messenger. So Todd, do you not want me to put them in the Zoom chat right here, but somewhere else? So this is the class. If you're interested in it, what's gonna happen is you're going to open this link and it'll take you directly to a scheduling page. And so I'm giving that to Todd right now and he'll put it in the chat for you. Take a look at it. Again, we are meeting live, so the dates are important, but everything is being recorded. So if you can't make these exact dates, you'll still be able to catch the recording. And it looks like one person has signed up already, that's cool. And so you'll click sign up 
And then you'll fill out this short form. And then this is where you redeem the coupon. So that's where you put the 30 off coupon that gets you $30 off. And then I'll immediately book you and then you'll add it to your calendar. You'll get a confirmation email. And in that confirmation email, there are two or three very important specific steps that include some software that we'll be using in the course. So that's the deal with Subliner. I feel seven days is a adequate amount of time to decide. I don't want to be manipulative, but I do want to hold your feet to the fire a little bit. I know some people need to check their finances, talk with their partner, and that's fine. Hopefully you can get that done in seven days and still get that bonus of the lifetime subscription to Subaligner, but I don't want the clock to just run out on you and you to forget about this offer. Okay, so Todd says he's got the link and the code is here on the screen for you, 30 off, that's three zero. OFF. And Todd, is there anything else you want to say about that? Or do you want to go to the giveaways now? I am having trouble posting that link in the chat. I don't know why Facebook maybe doesn't is worried about the link, but I don't know if you have access to it, Nathan, or if somebody, you can see it right there. It's just nathanlively.as.me slash subschool. It's not letting me post it. I'll try later, but yeah, that's fine. So we'll just read it out and people can just type it in and we'll figure out, figure that out later. So the URL is Nathan Lively, my name, dot as dot me slash sub school all one word so hopefully if you're watching this recording we will have that all figured out by then and we'll go ahead and give you the link to this presentation so i think i can share that now so i'll share this and i'll copy the link for you to be a commenter and maybe todd won't be able to put this link in there yet either but by the time within the next hour, we'll get all of these links up onto the event page in case we can't get them now. Yeah, come back to the event page and we'll make sure they're there. I wanted to add one note. You had mentioned given seven days, which is nice to, if you are like me and you work for, uh, you're an employee somewhere, there's a lot of times that the employer is looking, has a training budget and is looking for opportunities to spend that. And it can even be impressive if you bring something to them and say, hey, learned about something. I want to learn more about it. I have this opportunity. So Keep that in mind if you're in that situation. Thanks thanks for mentioning that. I'll just say that's not the first time I've heard that. Students and colleagues of mine do that all the time. Initially, it's something that they want and they bring it to their employer or their pastor or whatever, and it can be a really great educational opportunity. So yeah, thank you. Go ahead. For sure. All right, giveaways. Pick three winners randomly from the list of the email addresses that came in. And uh, we didn't collect last names. So there might be multiple people with the first name, which I just realized was a critical error on my part. But I will give you some hints that hopefully I've got your email address, but just so that if you're named the same, you don't get too excited so fast. Okay. Drawing number one is the $25 gift card to shop.pataday.com for it'll it's enough to get you a t-shirt. It's Brendan from the US and your email address starts with B-R-E-N. I don't know if there's multiple people. That's the best I could do. I didn't want to give away your your email too much. So Brendan, I'll be reaching out to you directly. The second winner is for a $50 gift card to shop.pataday.com. And that is Brian in the US. And your email starts with BMS. See if anybody's commenting. And then the last one for the year of Subaligner, I'm sorry, the lifetime subscription of Subaligner is Ben from the UK. And your email address starts with B-E-N-T. So those are the three winners. I will reach out. I'll reach out personally to those three folks with the prize. The email that you'll get at the end that will give you the presentation and all the links will come from a mailing list because there's so many people. So check your spam for that. And if you're on Gmail and you log in on the web, you can, if it shows up in promotions, it helps us and you'll see it to drag it over to the inbox just to show Gmail that it's a real something you want to take. So look for that email later today and congratulations to the three winners. Yes, all Bs, Julian. I couldn't believe it. So all Bs. So that's what I got, Nathan. I think we have a handful of questions. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. So look, we know we've gone way over time now, but you guys were nice enough to send us in questions. By the way, I don't have any motivations for why you should do this, except that it would help me. There's a link here in this form for giving me feedback. And that just takes you to a little form here where you can tell me what you liked and didn't like about this form. So I'll put that into the chat. Maybe we'll get it in today. Maybe we won't. But when you're looking at this stuff later and you see this pop up, please fill that out. So we had a bunch of 
questions that have come in. So here's what we'll do is we'll answer all the questions for the people who are here live. Cookie, Jim, David, Mark, Steve, Desi, and Linda, and John. And then I will go to the questions that people sent in ahead of time. And then we'll basically just go until I can't talk anymore. So feel free to put more questions in. Now's the time for that. Type your questions into the chat. And please, any questions about the concepts we talked about today, any questions about subschool or anything else, really anything goes here. And I can't promise that I have answers to everything. I definitely don't, but I'll try to be clear about that. And if it's something that I don't know, I'll try to look it up and I can put it into the event page later. Okay. So Kuki says that they're in Alaska. I know cold weather affects high frequencies. Does it also affect low frequencies being in cooler climate? Thanks. So it does, but only a little bit. So we're going to open up the speed of sound calculator from Merlin Van Veen. Don't be scared of this. I'm going to talk you through it. And actually, I want a different one. I want air absorption. Yeah, the biggest effect of the change of temperature in terms of air loss is in the high frequencies. So let me zoom in here. And let's say that we have the same distance. Let's say we're at 100 meters at every one of these. And let's say that they are all very hot. So we see that when we have high temperatures and high humidity, we have less air loss here. What we're seeing here is in this graph here, we're seeing high frequencies up here and we're seeing low frequencies down here. So in the low frequencies, nothing's happening. It's just nothing's going on. But there's a tiny bit of air loss here in the high frequencies. How much? At 100 meters, 30 degrees. I'm sorry, that's the altitude I was changing. So let's just say that the altitude is zero. And let's say that the distance is 100 meters. Okay, so at 100 meters, we are seeing some significant air loss. So at 12 kilohertz, we see 12 dB of air loss. That's quite a bit, right? And that makes sense to our ears. When we are very far away from something, we expect this curve down. Our ears tell us, hey, I hear this pink shift. I hear this attenuation. I know that I'm farther away. So that's one of our localization techniques. But there's really not much going on in the low end here. And you'll see we can move even farther away. So let's go to, can we go to 1,000 meters? And now we have a very high amount of high frequency air loss here, but still nothing going on in the low frequencies. And now let's go back to 100 meters and change the temperature. So we'll stay at 30 degrees Celsius for A and we'll go much colder. So let's go to 10 degrees Celsius for this guy. And that now that we've dropped temperature, now we have more high frequency air loss. And let's say that we're gonna go lower in humidity as well. So the lower the temperature we can see, we're lowering temperature and humidity and that's giving us lower, more high frequency air loss here, but still nothing happening in the low end. So I hope that answers your question, Kuki. Go ahead and download the air absorption calculator from Merlin Van Veen. If you just Google air absorption calculator, Merlin Van Veen, you will find it. Uh, it's at merlinvanveen.nl is the URL. And you'll be able to play around with this and adjust the temperature and see that the high frequencies change but not so much in the low frequencies. Now, what does that do to our alignments? Uh -oh. Well, one thing you can do in subaligner is you can change the speed of sound, but it's not really that important. If you play around with it, you will find this out because of what we just saw, this phenomenon that the temperature doesn't change, the, doesn't change it so much, especially when we're very close. So here I'm going to show you an alignment between an L Acoustics Kiva and an L Acoustics SB18. And the results don't really matter right now so much that we just want to see how much they change. Okay, so subaligner is saying, hey, you need to delay the sub by 8.75 milliseconds. So I'm just going to take a picture of that and I'll put it over here. 
And what we're going to do is I'll go to my profile and change the speed of sound. So right now the speed of sound is at 346 feet per second, uh, sorry, meters per second or 1135 feet per second. So very common speed of sound. So what needs to happen? So if we're going to drop the temperature, then let's go back to our speed of sound calculator here. So if we're going to drop the temperature down to 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, then now the speed of sound changes to 337.7. So we'll go to 337. I don't think I can put in decimals, so we'll just go 338. Okay, so now I've updated the speed of sound. So let's see how much this alignment changes. So I'll open this alignment again. I'll run this alignment again, but with the new speed of sound. And what we see is that the values have only changed a tiny bit. So they've changed from 8.75 to 8.95. So it's not nothing. And if you want to be highly accurate, you probably want to take a look at this. But it's not so much that we're way off. And this will be especially more important in the high frequencies, right? Shorter wavelengths. But in the low frequencies, our main subalignment, it is definitely less of a concern. But again, if you want to be highly accurate, you should probably take a look at it. And I'll just say one of the great things about having a tool like Subwoofer or your own tools, and some of our modeling software does this automatically, is that you can redo the alignment as many times as you want. So as soon as you st stand in the alignment position and you take your measurements to main and sub, your distance measurements, then if the temperature changes, you can just rerun the alignment. So let's say that you do your alignment in the morning where the temperature is very low and the humidity is high. And then let's say you get to the middle of the day when the show is and the temperature has changed by 30 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity has gone way down. You can just rerun the alignment. You don't have to get out all of your tools again, just change the speed of sound. And now you have your new alignment and you can put that into your output processor or your console. All right, Cookie, I hope that helps. Okay, let's go to Jam. So Jam says, when placing subs center stage and the stage is raised, placing subs and stage is raised, how does it affect the bass response if the face of the stage is a very hard surface versus a cloth-faced surface? I don't really know. I'm not an acoustician. But my guess is that if it's a cloth surface, then some of the sound will get through. It'll be semi-acoustically transparent and some of it will reflect. And if it's a rigid surface, then much more of it will reflect. So this is what acousticians call a, an absorption coefficient. So a high absorption coefficient is like an open window, right? The sound just goes out and never comes back. And then a low absorption coefficient is like a rigid surface where all of the sound bounces back. So you have the spectrum of how much is absorbed. So your question is, how does it affect the bass response? You get a reflection. And how the distance, the latency of that reflection will determine what it does to the sound. So if that reflection is late enough, you could have big cancellations. And if it's short enough, you might not hear it at all. This is one of those answers. It depends. But we could look at that. I will tell you that practically in the field, if I have a subwoofer that is near a wall and I'm not doing a cardioid array or whatever, it's just a single subwoofer, I will turn it around and face it at the wall and get it like six inches away from the wall. That way the reflection is completely in time and doesn't create any kind of cancellation or any comb filtering. Otherwise, I try to get as far away from the wall as possible. All right, I hope that helps, Jam. Let me know if you have any follow-up questions about that. Okay, David says, does a cardioid array with the inline gradient work to improve the lack of bass in the center image? The lack of bass in the center image. I don't think I understand that. David, maybe you could reword that. Or if somebody else understands, and as I'm talking about these questions, please feel free to put your answers into the chat. Like this doesn't just need to be about me we can try to help generate a lot of ideas for these people. So let me try and read this one more time. So does a cardioid array with an inline gradient work to improve the lack of base in the center image? Yeah, I don't think I quite understand that. Why is there a lack of base in the center image? Or maybe somebody else can answer that question. Nathan, maybe his situation, if it's a, an install, maybe that maybe they have that lack of base in the center. 
and he's looking for a way to fix it. So it's a general question. Not sure. Yeah. If you put subs in the center, yeah, that's going to help in the center. But I, I guess I don't know why there's a lack of base in the center to begin with. But yes, room. Yeah. yeah. if there is a lack of base for some reason, yes, putting subs in the center will help. Okay. Mark says, how wide is too wide for center subs? Okay. So Mark, you are going to want to download Merlin Van Veen. His, num his name is going to come up a lot. You're going to want to download Merlin Van Veen's subwoofer array designer. Okay. Let me just give you a quick preview. We're going to be using subwoofer array designer a lot in sub school. And I'm going to open this up. And if you've never seen it before, it's going to look a little bit scary because it has a lot of graphs. It's just a little like a little bit of a complicated Excel spreadsheet. There's a lot going on here, but if you go through it step by step, it is super helpful. And so what you can do here is you can create a line of subwoofers and you can start with one. Let me take these filters out. And you have one subwoofer. And so you're, you have perfect coverage here. And then you can put in a second subwoofer. And so now it's slightly wider, right? And we see the this coverage pattern here start to narrow a little bit. Now I'll put in three subwoofers. Now the line gets longer and we'll see the coverage start to narrow even more. And now I can add four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty 20 subwoofers. And we'll see some pretty amazing narrowing until it's like a knife pick. So how many subs is too wide? That's going to depend on the width of your audience. And you can figure out specifically exactly which width of subwoofer line will match your audience shape using this and other tools. There's other tools out there. I just find that this is one of the easiest. Okay. So Steve says, when I do center, I get a good all around base, but the throw is shorter. So can't reach the back of the audience as well as I, if I do left or right. Why is this? We saw that at the very beginning, right? So let's jump up to the beginning here. I think I can do that here. You can see that here in these images. Check out this color right here. We only get to this dark blue color back here when we have the center sub. But over here, we get way past that. So you can see this is what I think Mark, this is what Steve is talking about, is that when we have this narrowing effect, we're putting more of the energy into this area and we're pushing it out farther. Let me see why is this? Well, that's because you're creating this area summation, you're basically reorganizing the energy. Let's say that we have the same amount of energy in both of these designs here. Let's say same amount of energy as we do here, but this one, we're spreading the energy out evenly around the audience. And this one, we're focusing the energy. So because we have focused energy, it's going farther. I hope that helps. Okay. Desi says, what if you had your subs coupled on one side of a venue indoors to retain uniformity? How do you handle alignment with the tops? So I would typically do whichever one it's nearest. So that's a trick that you may have heard other people talk about. I don't do it very often anymore, but yeah, if you have a, a narrow stage where it doesn't matter that much, if you have subs on the left or the right or the center, you can't get that center position. Maybe you go to one side, just put all of your subs on one side. In that case, I would align to the main speaker that's up above. Okay, so that's the procedure I would use, especially if the hang that's farther from the subs. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. I would typically align to the main hang that's closest to wherever the group of subwoofers is. All right, Linda says, by the way, it's not that way every time. I was trying to decide whether or not I should explain my reasoning for that. And I'm not going to get into it too much because I have found that I changed my decision depending on the modeling and prediction software that I'm looking at. So if I'm in one of those situations, I usually try to test both in a model. And I'll say, hey, in this model, what does the prediction look like if I do the alignment between these two sources? Okay, I see that, take a snapshot of it. Now, what's the alignment look like if I do the alignment between the subs here and the mains way over here? Now, what's that look like? Is there more variance or less variance? And I imagine myself moving around in the audience. And sometimes I have seen situations where it looks like it makes more sense and less variance to align with the sub that's farther away. 
It, logically, it doesn't really make sense, but I have seen it happen. All right, Linda says, I've read that when using a left-right configuration, towing in the speakers towards the center can balance peaks and valleys. So I would say it's the other way around, right? Like this picture. So I would tow out, right? Because you want less interaction in the center. If you tow in your arrays and you aim them in, you're gonna have more interaction in the center. You're going to increase this power valley situation and increase this power alley situation and your contrasts will be even greater. So I think it's the other way around. Linda says, something to do with precedence effect and Haas effect. Any comments on this? I don't think that has anything to do with precedence effect and Haas effect. You're not changing the timing of anything. You're just aiming more of that energy towards the center. Yeah, so I, I would do the opposite of that typically. Linda, question, are there any benefits drawbacks between reflex and horn type sub cabinet designs? Oh, this is, so this is where I'm not gonna have any information for you because I've never built a subwoofer in my life. I don't know that much about the different designs. So just fair warning, I probably won't be able to help you. Benefits drawbacks between reflex and horn type sub cabinet designs when deployed in small venues where the audience is extremely close to the ground stack audience able to touch the stack? Yeah, I don't know. There are probably people here who do know. So if you have an answer for Linda about the benefits and drawbacks between reflex and horn type subs, then please type that into the chat. John Luke says, question, does a flown array put ground stack subs out of phase? No, you would align them. So what typically happens is one of two situations. By the way, I don't really understand why people do ground subs. I unless it's an infra sub. So we'll talk about these two situations. Number one, if you have phone subs and ground subs, then they're probably either doing double duty, which means they're do their exact same model doing the exact same thing, right? So the bottom ground sub is more like a fill sub, or maybe the top sub is more like a fill sub trying to fill in farther in the back. I don't know, but you would align those the same. So you would align main and sub up here. So remember, always start with your coupled subsystems when you're doing alignment and then move to your uncoupled subsystems. That's the workflow. And then you would align main to the ground sub. And I actually have a video all about this. So no, not that one, sorry. On subaligner.com, I have a bunch of Q&A videos that I put together with questions that people have sent me about how to use subaligner. And this, it's this one, how to align flown and ground subwoofers. So I'll put that into the chat right now. And if you don't get the link, then just search for this title in YouTube, how to align flown and ground subwoofers using subaligner. So I'm giving this to Todd, but again, I don't know if we can put links in the chat yet. Oh, the, sorry, so the other situation. So that's situation number one, another common situation is that one of your subs is actually spectrally divided. You have your main sub and then you have an infra sub. So if you look at some subwoofers, DMB does this a lot. They have one preset that is default for a subwoofer, and then they have one that's infra sub and it has like more low frequency content. And so sometimes you split this up. So if you look at a frequency response, you have your mains, then your subs, and then your infra subs down below that. So if you have this, spectrum split up like that, then you would need to align your flown mains to your ground. I'm sorry, your flown subs to your ground subs. But that wasn't your question. John said, does a flown array put ground stack subs out of phase? Not necessarily. Unfortunately, this is a it depends question. But let me try to give you something more concrete. Does a flown array put ground stack subs out of phase? I would say if it's beyond six degree, six feet, yes. I think this is the common metric used. If you're within six feet and you have two speakers that are designed to be aligned out of the box and you don't have to do anything to them, you just put them up and they work, then that's great. But if you go beyond six feet, then that's when you are out of phase. How about that? That's probably a better answer than that longer one I get. So Brian says, do subs need to be equally spaced or can they be in pairs? I'm assuming that you mean like just some kind of horizontal line or an arc or something. I don't know why they would be in pairs, but you could definitely do that. So 
typically when I see a line that, also, that is made up of pairs of subwoofers, that's because you're combining a directional array with a line, with a, an arc sub or something like that. Excuse me. So I'm not sure if I'm quite clear on the question, but I guess there's nothing wrong with pairs, but no, they're typically evenly spaced and you'll see that sometimes they won't look evenly spaced if you're doing a physical arc, but they're evenly spaced, like still center to center on an arc. So I'm not sure if that helps, Brian, but maybe write in with some further details. Okay, this is fun. So we're getting to the end of the live questions here. So if you still have any questions that you want me to answer live, get those into the chat, and then I will move to the questions that people sent in ahead of time. Okay, so Lloyd says, question, does a properly confined, does a properly configured in-fire array behave like a vertical or horizontal array? Does it behave like a vertical or horizontal array? In some ways, yes. One way I can think of is that if you just have a horizontal array with no processing, just a, hor just a line of speakers, then we know that as we go up in frequency and wavelength gets smaller, that coverage angle will also get smaller. So the coverage will change over frequency. And the same thing is true of your in-fire array. So let's find that. Here we go. So check out these polar patterns. In this gradient polar pattern, you can see that it's very consistent over frequency. It's a very similar pattern. In this in-fire array, you can see that it changes over frequency. As frequency goes up, it gets more narrow. And so I guess that is one way that just lines of subwoofers and a vertical array are similar. So you said, does a properly configured in-fire behave like a vertical or horizontal array? So in that way, yes. In other ways, no. Like a vertical and horizontal array, you're narrowing the beam, but it's coming out of front and back. And in a vertical, in a cardioid array, in an in-fire array, our goal here is that as much as possible, we have summation in the front and then cancellation in the rear. Joe says, how do you pick your desired frequency for summation and alignment. So Joe, summation and alignment. Joe, I'm not sure if you're talking about building directional arrays or if you're talking about maybe a main sub alignment. So maybe I'll just touch on both and you'll write in and tell me if it was something else. So how do you pick your desired frequency for summation and alignment? So when it comes to designing these directional arrays, I don't look at a single frequency. I look at the entire operating range. So I open the spec sheet for the sub and it says this subwoofer's operating range is from 35 hertz to 110 hertz. So then I design my array so that it also basically has that bandwidth so that the operational range of the subwoofer matches the operational range of the array. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, when it comes to main sub alignment, that is 100% has to do with the level relationship. And that will depend on how much haystacking you're going to do in the field. So everybody turns up their subs in the field. It happens almost all the time. I have a picture maybe that will help. So here we go. So here's a plot of a main sub relationship. And you can see that the subwoofer is turned up here about 12 dB compared to the low mids of the mains. And I do that in subaligner because I know that you're going to do that in the field. <laughs> I'm not blaming anyone. I have just found through doing tests with people and myself that everybody turns up the sub. So I pre do that pre, I do the alignment in subaligner predicting that the crossover region is going to move up. So the alignment crossover region that you want to look at has to do with the magnitude offset here. So imagine if you turn this sub down 30 dB. Now the alignment crossover region is going to be down here. It's not up here. This is a big surprise for a lot of people who have been used to looking at alignment at a single frequency. Sometimes, I think all of us starting out, we look at our presets, our electronic filters, and they say our high pass and our low pass filters are at 80 hertz. So we say, okay, that's our alignment frequency. But that doesn't make any sense 
if that's not what is happening acoustically. So you have to look at what is happening acoustically once you actually turn those things on in the field. And so that's why when you do alignment, if you're going to do alignment in the field with an audio analyzer, or even when you're doing your pre-alignment delay values at the warehouse, the first thing you do is set the level. And you do that by ear, or you do that with an audio analyzer or both. So you set the level, and then you find the crossover region. And what I have been teaching for the last few years is to look at the relationship where the magnitudes are within 10 dB of each other. We call this the combing zone. That is the most critical area where you have the highest opportunity for summation and the biggest risk for cancellation. Turn So either turn both on or measure them one at a time and find that relationship first. Look at where they have you know, magnitudes that are within 10 dB and that's where you should be looking at then when you do your alignment. Or that's, and that's the area you should be listening to if you're doing this by ear. All right, Joe, thanks for the question. I hope that helped. We are now going to go to questions that people sent in ahead of time. And I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but I'll try to do as many as I can before I pass out. So let's do them in order. Number one, some questions about coupled versus uncoupled subwoofers. So Jim Trudel says, in complicated acoustic environments, does it make more sense to look at one subwoofer array cleverly designed for maximum coverage or multiple smaller arrays working together? Jim, there is some really clear math related to critical distance and the level of reverberation that shows that when we reduce the number of sources, that sound quality increases. Why? Because we have less sound bouncing all around, and therefore we can increase the amount of direct sound we get to our audience. Now, of course, if we have a very wide audience or a very deep audience, so much so that it is impossible to cover with a single array or two arrays or whatever, then we do have to add speakers. But I think the takeaway here is that we just want to be careful with adding too many speakers unnecessarily, therefore decreasing that direct sound that we're delivering to the audience and making everything more mushy and more reverberation. Okay, Jim also says, how do you mitigate cancellation in hotspots when using multiple arrays? So the two tools that I know about are isolation, right? So we try to aim things away from each other so that we have isolation. This speaker, you cover this part of the audience. This speaker, you cover this part of the audience. And then we have a little bit of interaction in the middle, a little bit of comb filtering in the middle, but we try to isolate that as much as possible. And then the other one is decorrelation that we talked about earlier, right? So if two things 100% overlap, and if you want to reduce that comb filter, then you can consider trying to decorrelate those two signals so they're no longer exactly the same. Somehow, double miking, reverb, other things. Okay. So Nipun says, controlling boominess in small rooms and halls with bad acoustics. Okay, I would say number one is room design, right? So that would be a wrecking ball, take out the walls, put up lots of low frequency absorption. You don't want to put up too much high frequency absorption, but yes, low frequency absorption because most halls have too much low frequency reverb. Now, we might not all have access to that, or maybe you're just doing a show somewhere temporarily for maybe for a day or two. In that case, the tools that we have at our disposal as sound engineers are the directivity of our sources, and we can control the number of elements in the sound system. So maybe we try to use fewer elements. And then maybe at the end of the day, we use a, maybe a little bit of EQ can help to remove a little bit some of those frequencies that are some of the worst offenders, but maybe that doesn't always work. And then Christian says, how do I set up woofers in front of a wall directly in the corner? Or is it possible to set them up 1.5 to 2 meters in front of the wall. So we talked about this a little bit already, but consider the fact that the late arrival from bouncing off of the wall is like a mirror image coming from the other side of the wall. There's like another source over there. And it's the same thing as the power alley from a left-right source. So if we go back up here and look at this guy, imagine, oops, I don't know why that's blacking out the screen. Okay, I'll just have to show you here. So imagine that instead of this being a left-right subwoofer pair, there's actually a wall down the middle here. It's the exact same phenomenon. And then up here is your subwoofer, 
and it's a couple of meters away from the wall or whatever. The mirror image, imaginary subwoofer on the other side of the wall is arriving later. So you have a reflection off of the wall that's arriving later, and it's going to create this kind of comb filtering in your response and in the room based on the distance of the distance from the wall and the latency from that reflection. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about what is the distance away from the wall. And I don't know if this will help, but my general guidance is either couple with the wall, so get as close as possible to the wall, which usually means turning the subwoofer around and facing at the wall, and then you're six, like six inches away from the wall, or get as far as possible away from the wall. Okay. And usually the best, the choice I usually go with is trying to use a directional way, a directional array, and then getting away from the wall. Okay, let's jump back down to our list of questions. Thank you guys, by the way, for sticking around. I don't know how many people are still with us, but I wanted to be respectful of the people that sent in questions ahead of time and cover this stuff. And also, I'm hoping that this will inspire some of you to maybe check out SubSchool and look at some of this information that we're going to be talking about. Okay, we had one question from Thomas in this category. What is the difference between physical arc sub and virtual arc sub? So the difference is placement versus delay. So physical arc sub, you physically arc the speakers and in a virtual or delayed arc sub, you just have a line and then you do the arc with delay on different on each of the units. So from the perspective of the listener up here or wherever they are, that they perceive a delay they perceive an arc of subwoofers because of the... Another difference is that the virtual version of the arc sub avoids a tiny focused rear beam. So if you have a physical arc of subs, you get this beam of sound that goes right into your lead vocal mic. And so this is why a virtual arc is often preferred. Okay, a question here about flown subs from Aaron. What happens to the power alley with flown subs? So nothing. It's the exact same pattern just raised up into the air. And the only change is that the overall level comes down in the front. And so then you have less variation from front to back, but it's still the exact same pattern, which you can see in these images here. And now questions about cardioid arrays. So Kyle says, you have four subs and are able to center them, if you please. What's your go-to deployment? So my go-to deployment would be an inline gradient. And if I have more than two, then I just stack them up higher. Or there are many variations of the gradient. So there are variations with four where you could either face all the drivers towards each other, you can face them away. And this gives you different results that so you can control the coverage angle. So yeah, that's what I would do. Either gradient array stacked up or four together and then design a gradient that would work with all of those. Carolina says, which sub to reverse in a two element stack? So I have a video all about this, which you can take a look at later. Hey, this, I'm not sure why this is making my screen go. It's because it's going to the whiteboard. How do I turn that off? There we go. So consider the orientation of the drivers. So in this image, we have a driver in this area and a driver in this area. So in an in a two element inverted gradient stack here, then the line of cancellation is going to go through here. Now, that's not the be all end all of this array, but that is one thing to consider, right? So if you do it the other way around and you have this one facing forward and this one facing rear, then the line of cancellation would go up like this, right? So check out this video, see if that helps. Tinde says, how do you align cardioid subarrays blocks of three without a speaker processor? So if you don't have an output processor, then hopefully you can use your console's output delay, or you have built-in output processing in your sub. That's the only way I know how to do it. You can't do it with placement, because if you change the placement and you change the orientation of the array just for the alignment in the rear, then you mess up the alignment in the front. So that's how I know how to do it. 
Innocent says, how do I set up an infire using inverted gradient stacks? Innocent, you would just do that by replacing every element in the infire array with it with inverted gradient stacks. So you take your inverted gradient stack and one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. Now to me, this seems a little bit inefficient, but I've never tried it, mostly because we need sound going to the back to create the cancellation, but maybe it would work really well. I've never taken a look at it. I think it's a cool idea. Okay, Alicia says, picking the correct low pass filter. If you have flown and ground subs, should those filters be the same? We talked about this a little bit already. Just consider whether the subs are doing double duty, whether they are like main and fill sub, or if you're having like an infrasonic extension. So if it's an infrasonic extension, then that low pass filter is gonna go lower so that you have a spectral divide. Michael says, how many subs do you need in one stage when it comes to area scale and total viewer? So I don't really know the answer to this question. And I would just say that can consider what we've been discussing about subwoofer directivity, right? The acoustics of the space are going to play a large part in power scaling. The other thing is that there's no single number on a spec sheet to really describe the main sub relationship. Now, sometimes in manufacturer product materials, they, they will say, hey, for every one of these speakers, you need two of these speakers, or for every one of these speakers, you need three of these speakers. But they don't necessarily tell you, hey, for this amount of people, that kind of stuff. So my suggestion, is that you observe this relationship between main and sub in your modeling software, right? And so if you have 3D modeling software, Map3D, SoundVision, ArrayCalc, you can put your entire system in there and just make sure that at various places in the audience, you always have enough low mids from your mains to keep up with your subs or enough subs to keep up with your low mids from your mains. There is an alternative to this. You can play around with this in subaligner. So one thing that I like to check in subaligner is I'll say, hey, do I have enough mains and subs to keep up? So this says, turn the subwoofers down. So I have plenty of subwoofers, but what if I only had two subwoofers? And it says, hey, you need to turn this up. Oh, I did the wrong thing, sorry. I changed the distance. What if you only have two subwoofers? Now it says, hey, now you need to turn the mains down for by 40B. And maybe I don't wanna do that and say, oh, I don't have enough subwoofers. So how many subwoofers do I need? Well, there's a way to calculate that, but you could just like trial and error, change the number of subwoofers in subaligner until you reach parity, basically. So there's some ideas for you. Anthony says, why are some, what are some great spreadsheets or software to build arrays virtually? We talked about subwoofer array designer, Map3D, SoundVision, ArrayCalc. Those are some that I would recommend looking at. Robert says, where is a good point of crossover between top and sub loudspeaker? We talked about this already, but just to review, number one, it's typically set by the manufacturer. Number two, observe the magnitude relationships. And then you want to really have your alignment really well done where the magnitude relationships are very close. And I have this article that I want you to look at called, does every output in the signal chain need a high pass filter? Because maybe you don't need one at all. Like I said, if some loudspeakers are designed to work together out of the box, then you probably don't need to do anything because the manufacturers have taken care of that for you already. Okay, Jan says, are all-pass filters used for widening of subarrays? So yeah, you can use an all-pass filter in place of or in addition to delay. I've never done this. And when I do tests, to me, it never seems more beneficial than just using delay, but I know people do it. So yeah, I'm sure you can. And Renee says, is subs on an aux a good thing? Well, I would just say, consider that you are attempting to match two coherent sources. So if you have two coherent sources and then you send one of them off to do something else and then come back and combine with the other one, now you have some doubts, right? Are they still coherent? Are they still aligned? What happened over here? So my recommendation is if you must do this, and I never do this anymore, but if you feel like you must do this, if you must create a separate mix that just goes to your subwoofer, then, e then do subs on a group so that the levels are always the same, 
and make sure that those paths are exactly matched. So if you're going to insert plugins on one, insert the exact same plugin under the other. Or you have to go through all of the work of using an audio analyzer to match the delay exactly. And if you check out Robert Scoville's YouTube channel, he has a lot of information about this. I would also recommend that you check out Michael Curtis's YouTube channel. <laughs> he has this a great video called Quit Using Oxfed Subs. So take a look at that. I like it when people take like a clear stance. Okay, those are all the questions. Man, I can't believe I did. Oh, there's one more. Uh, John Luke says, how are delays calculated when doing a center ground subarray? How are delays calculated? I don't know what that means, John. If it's just a center ground subarray, it could be anything. So what I use is subwoofer array designer, typically, and then I'll finish that up in some modeling software like Map3D. That's how I calculate the delays for most of the arrays that I work on start in subwoofer array designer, unless I just know some template off the top of my head or some way that I've done it in the past. Hopefully that helps, John. All right, you guys, I feel like all of you who stayed here for the entire two hours and 20 minutes should really get some kind of award. Todd, thank you so much for sticking around and allowing us to have some extra time here. And yeah, is there anything else you want to say to wrap up? Yeah, thanks for everybody for uh, staying. And Nathan, that was you're a trooper. I put in the chat and everybody agreed that two, uh, two plus hours of teaching is pretty impressive. So we all appreciate it. I hope everybody got something they can take away, large or small, and check out SubSchool. The links are there. Make sure you've got that. You put your email in that form. We'll send you everything here shortly. The uh, presentation, the link to the video will stay in the event page. So when we're done and we end it, it will stay there so you can watch it later and we'll get you all the information. So thank you, Nathan. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend.